The first time I smoked pot was the summer at an uncle's softball game. About the third inning, I walked off towards the mosh meadow and smoked a joint someone rolled for me. I got high. I remember everything changed. Suddenly, the trees were more colorful. The sun was brighter and the wind pulsed in the sky. I could hear a faint beetle song in my head. Hey, bungalow bill. I was 12 years old and at that moment I felt complete. The earth became a big marshmallow and the clouds were erotic smiley faces. Suddenly the only worry I had was maybe confronting adult because maybe no words would come out. So I played, so I stayed hidden and enjoyed the ride. I began to see things that weren't there before. The lonely critical voices in my head became friendly and inviting, even sexual. They were like a new set of friends, exciting to be around. It was like a new planet and a new identity. In this, in this fresh new world of vividness and clarity, I discovered life wasn't so meaningless after all. And for another 18 years, I chased that high with every ounce of my being. When I first tried cocaine, just like the first time I smoked pot, I knew everything was about to change. It, inst it instantly delivered a new sense of freedom and joy. The salesman in my head also realized that cocaine and rich kids had something in common. It's expensive and most of these kids had deep pockets. At the age of 20, there began my career as a campus drug dealer. And there I suddenly began to feel a sense of fitting in. I was now able to get into parties and the same kids that wouldn't talk to me before were suddenly waving me over to say hello. The girls took notice too. Then the drug stopped working again and there were many days and nights spent on the floor thinking people were outside looking in through the window or under the door. The audio and visual hallucinations, the 50 hour coke binges that ended in cold sweats and terror hiding the stash so that if the police busted in, they wouldn't find anything. I knew the drug stopped working many years before this. I had turned the corner where they just made me paranoid, to the point of wanting to kill myself or somebody else. When the police finally cracked down and the supply dried up, so dried up my entity, identity as the campus drug lord. In some ways, the crackdown was a relief an opportunity to kick the habit once and for all, and to do something right for a change. The emotional withdrawals from drugs, money, and the big shot status I had established was the most devastating I had experienced to date. It felt like I had fallen in the ditch and there was no way out. Uh, so, after college, things changed a bit, and I changed with it. When I moved back to Staten Island, I had a degree in healthcare and worked as a dietitian in a nursing home. I was still experiencing psychosis from heavy substance abuse, but was able to hold a job for a while. I lived in my grandmother's basement. I started a rock band that sang poetic songs about dysfunctional sex and reckless drug use, violence, and power. Everyone loved the band, and we sang. We, we were signed. We signed with a New Jersey record label and released an album. There were many profound evenings out in the New York underground where I, where, I, where I felt like life had meaning again. I felt important, connected to something greater than myself. I was suddenly a man with a microphone looking out over a thousand people looking back at me. Then, like everything else, the band started to fall apart and I started back with the drugs, but this time heroin. I slipped further and further to the point of living hand to mouth on the streets of the Lower East Side of Manhattan. But somewhere in my mind, I thought I had beaten the system. I was free like a bird. No bills to pay, no boss or family nagging me to clean up my act. No band problems, no girlfriend trying to run my life. My existence became painfully insignificant. Go to the methadone clinic, the crack spot, stand on the heroin line. Steal from the chain store to pay the drug dealer. Hustle the city streets, ripping off tourists, jumping the turnstiles, and sleeping in empty houses or on a park bench. We're not sleeping at all. There were the jails, the detox units, the rehabilitation centers, 
food stamps, welfare, and whatever else you can imagine at the bottom of city life. In the end, I would stand in front of a restaurant or a storefront and look in at the happy faces inside and say to myself, how did I end up out here? What did I do to deserve this? Once when I was buying heroin at Sunset Park in Brooklyn, I got jumped, jumped by drug dealers who mistaken me for someone who was trying to rip me off. A few doors down, I had already made my drug purchase and had two bags of dope tightly in my hand. All of a sudden, a giant man tackles me and another hits me in the face with something. I felt the side of my cheek cave in. I was getting kicked and punched by a group of thugs for what seemed like an hour until finally I found a hole in the crowd and ran for my life. With blood pouring down my face and with what felt like a, dozen, a, a few broken ribs, I kept running and realized through all the kicking and punching, I still had the bags of dope firmly in my hand. At that moment, the drugs were the most important thing in my life. I used to paint my fingernails, my eyes and fingernails black, and with a stolen box of cheap hair dye and scissors, I would style my hair different colors. From a slender 180 pounds, I dropped to 150. I could see and feel my ribs protrude. My face and eyes sunk in like caves. The clothes I wore told the story of a young man who was once 30 pounds heavier. Nothing fit anymore, and I would regularly install new holes in the one belt I owned to hold up my pants. My skin took on the pale gray color of death. My breath was corrosive, teeth a funny bright yellow. My gums bled constantly. I could smell ammonia and the taste of copper from my own blood. My eyes were half closed most of the time. My mouth froze in a permanent frown. I would often lose my balance and fall down in the streets. My knees would suddenly buckle under my own weight. My joints ached and I, could see, I couldn't see clear anymore. The only pair of glasses I owned broke long ago in a heated brawl. Most of the time I felt hungry but couldn't eat. Most of the time I couldn't urinate or defecate without extreme effort. Each day the track marks on my arm grew a little deeper and a little wider. Each day I, sh I shriveled a little more into oblivion. Each day my, lung, my life hung, hung on by a thread. Marcus Conti reporting. A little reading from the good book. Who wrote that stuff? Who on earth wrote that stuff? Uh, Marcus Conti. Wake yourself up. Spiritual enlightenment right here, right now. So this is a book. This is, uh, hi, Marcus Conti reporting. I'd like to introduce myself. And... Um, tell you a little bit about why I'm, why I'm doing this. And, uh, and I always knew that this day would come where I would have to defend my, my, uh, <laughs> my past, who I am, where I come from. And uh, in 2012, I wrote this book. And if you notice in every one of my videos, this book has been offered free of charge. It's never been, I've never hidden <laughs> anything about who I, who I am. In fact, I, I've actually promoted it and want other people to know about it and uh it's free for it's free if you like that's where i just read from and um you could also you could also get it here on ebay for uh not ebay i'm sorry amazon hold on a second <laughs> the old cat is crying you could um you could buy it on on uh you could buy it on amazon wake yourself up spiritual enlightenment right here right now for a book I also wrote this book, The uh, Psychic Investor. Why am I doing this? Why am I telling you guys this? Because I think that because you are, people say, who do you work for? You hear that a lot, right? You hear that a lot in this uh, truther community. Who are you working for? I work for you. And I work for the, for the, for the, comment, the people that comment, the people that watch the videos, the people that participate. Right? I, you, your PayPal and your... Patreon contributions, your pay purchasing of stickers, you are spreading the message of, of this this truth, right? The the messages, you know, the the news that I present is is who I work for, and um, and I don't uh, I don't dis discount that at all, you know. So so this is my resume to you. I want you to know who I am, where I came from, and that story I read to you is painfully the truth about where I 
where the from from the highs to the lows. Now there's a lot of other highs because I was able to survive that and haven't had the need to uh, use a drink or a drug for I think it's 25 years now. Last time I used uh, uh, drugs was uh, 1994, uh, and a lot a lot has transpired um, in that. And uh, so I want to tell you more about that. I'll tell you more about it as we go along. So. So these are the two books. If you want to read uh, Wake Yourself Up, you can buy it for a buck in a Kindle form or you can download it right down below for free. And um, this is looking like it's becoming a collector's item, The Psychic Investor. This is a book I wrote in the late 90s about using psychic phenomena to outwit the stock market. I came up with a pseudonym, Marcus Goodwin. Um, my, my real name is Marcus, Mark Conti. Marcus, I took on Marcus as a name, and uh, looking like it's becoming a collector's item. If you want it new, it's two hundred and two hundred thirty-nine dollars. So that's a pretty cool book. I, I have a few copies left of, uh, for my own uh, sake. And uh, let's talk about the music, right? I'm also a musician. This is one of the albums. Uh, I was in this band. One of my favorite. Well, this is one of my favorite images from the uh, from the late '80s, early '90s. Barney Rubble and the Constable was the band I was in, pornographic rock band, was was on the verge of breaking out. And, um, you know, this is right before the, uh, the, the collapse, the collapse into the drug uh, days. Uh, you can hear some of it. You idiot! You ruined my Sonny Bono wig! So you can you can you can enjoy that on yourself. I also uh, was a I, there's other stuff. I'm also the ghost of Brooklyn. There's uh, I don't know, maybe seven or eight albums full of acoustic music. There's all kinds of music and, and stuff up here, right? And uh, I'm going to get into the dirty part now, right? So how, why the whistleblower? Why become a news guy? So, so right around the time of uh, writing this uh, Psychic Investor book, I started to you know, write and uh, continue the musical stuff, and that's where the, a lot of the Ghost of Brooklyn ideas came up and all those albums. You can find them all on YouTube. Actually, I, I probably, I'm not going to put those links below, but just, um, you can just uh, search The Ghost of Brooklyn, you could also search Barney Rubble and the Cunt Stubble, and we did it as as um, as as close as uh, 2004. Now I'm gonna stick it deep. Yeah. We were down in the Lower East Side playing. Right up in your To be young again, to be to be a teenage adult, gotta love it, man. So, um, all right. So let's get into the uh, the little dirtier part now. So so then there's this this business of every all my uh, videos about exposing the Department of Sanitation. So I worked for the Department of Sanitation as a sanitation enforcement agent from 2014 to 2015. It's a shitty little job, civil service test here in New York. You take the test, you pass, they call you, you go down and uh, apply. And long story short, what, what I discovered in that, um, in that uh, experience was a, uh, uh, you know, a situation where you were, you were being asked to, to uh, illegally write tickets, excessive tickets. Right? Now, ticket quotas are illegal. Law enforcement ticket quotas are illegal in the country, right? And they're illegal for a good reason. So they are, hold on one second, hold on one second, hold on one second. I'll be right back.
Stand by. Please stand by. I am back. I am back. I had to let the cat out. So, so, um, so there I was as a sanitation enforcement agent with uh, all this vivid background and stuff. And, uh, you know, all my, my whole past, my whole uh, background is, has been um, pretty much flushed out. You, you wouldn't be in a law enforcement position if they didn't um, know exactly who you were. So, so I did this job, and I in it. Long story short, you can watch all the YouTube videos. My first two hundred YouTube videos were about exposing this uh, this ticket quota. ABC picked up the story. Ma- mainstream media did a great job of it. And if you search my YouTube videos from oldest to newest, you'll see them in chronological order, all the way back to two, uh, all the way. To the present, I think we're up to about 900. I'm up to about 970 videos now. And uh, so, but I want to. What I want to talk about is this: is this lawsuit, right? And what the reason why? Because I had exposed a a a ticket quota, and in that process, I was being discriminated against for a variety of reasons. I was being defamed. They wanted me out of there, right? Because I was I was talking. And in in those types of positions, you don't talk. You just um, you just take it or uh, or leave. You quit, right? So so I clocked them at about I don't know maybe if you do the math over a thirty year period with an illegal ticket quota. Right? Ticket quotas are illegal, so it's important to understand that. If you don't like ticket quotas, then you change the law. But they're they're illegal for a reason because they force law enforcement to write tickets that they ne- they didn't necessarily see. Or they, they bend the rules because they have to make that quota or they get in trouble. And uh, so, so I, I took that story uh, along with evidence of the ticket quota to ABC, broke the story. And to my, to my um, uh, credit, I was able to stop a ticket quota in the city of New York. Right? $600 million over a period of 30 years had been stolen from the residents of New York City. And I was able to stop it. And I had, uh, using YouTube, I was able to communicate with the, the people inside of DSNY, inside of the Department of Investigations, a bunch of some of the AG, uh, IG uh, people, and, um, and, and just mostly a lot of good people inside feeding me information inside the D, uh, Department of Sanitation, DSNY. And I left there with really no animosity towards the workers. In fact, I, I'm kind of like a folk hero in the, inside the Department of Sanitation as a result of it, and from the city of New York. But the point, the point that I, what I discovered is that in speaking up, in blowing a whistle, and I did sue, and I'm going to get into the lawsuit in a second. Uh, I sued, and uh, but but what I discovered is that that you can with when you when you fly directly into the truth, you can change public policy. Right? So New York City public policy is is forever changed because of what I did, right? And you hear that other, you know, that story of me as a child, and I was like, that's a story that, like, that person, the person I was became this other person who who saw the, you know, I guess you, when you see death, when you're looking in, you know, you're looking in the eyes of death, and and um, I don't know, that's just, that is just my, my perspective you know that that is who I am. I am the, uh, the the guy who tries to be you know in the truth, and on the front lines of uh, exposing corruption. You know, so there is no longer a ticket quota in New York. I was able to uh, to expose that. This is a this is my lawsuit against the city of New York, pro se, one hundred percent written and authored by me. Uh, it talks about the whole situation. If you're interested, I'll put all the links down below. First, the first 200 videos, it was all there already. So none of this is, I'm not breaking any news here. I'm just, it was already broken a year ago. So, but, and the people that have been following along, Price Sterling, um, Sterling Price, excuse me, and uh, Judy Kopp, and there was a lot of, a lot of people that uh, are still following this uh, channel that were there from the very beginning and know the, you know, they know the, tr- the, the story. And um, so I was fighting this lawsuit on many fronts, uh, Department of Sanitation, not only was the enforcement side of it, 
not only was involved in the legal ticket quota, but they were also racially divided. 80, 87% or 90% of the, um, the workers were either black or Hispanic. And I was, you know, this older white guy. They preyed on younger black uh, you know, enforcement agents to go out and break the law. And I was able to expose that as well. And, um, and in this lawsuit, uh, ultimately, it's, you know, the, the old saying, I, I, you know, I fight authority, authority always wins. So I fought them on the on discrimination, uh, mosaic of discriminatory seven um, protected classes, race, uh, I'm white, age, over anything over 50, 51. I was an old white guy, right, with a conviction record, right, arrest record. Uh, you know, they're all Christian. I was, I guess I was Buddhist, right? Uh, a disability because of the drug history that I just talked about. They knew this stuff and they used it against me, right? Basically. Now that is a stretch. I don't, I don't know if that's entirely true, but it certainly felt like that, you know, that in conjunction with blowing the whistle, right? Why were they, why were they attacking me? And, and a long story short, they made up 10 frivolous, uh, allegations, I did this, I did that, I did the other thing. I, but the, 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 the truth is that I wrote 10 tickets every single day, day in, day out, and uh, was one of their, their, um, their highest producers, uh, most consistent producers. And you can hear all, like I said, just, just search the YouTube videos backwards and you'll find it. Now, here's the, here's the dust up. People are, are uh, I'm hearing things through the grapevine. And, uh, oh, Conti's a criminal. Well, here is the... Here is my street creed, right? And this is all public record. It's in the documents. I, I made it available for, for, for 200 videos. I took it out because people, I guess, lost interest. And I had changed, um, I had switched gears and gone more into uh, the big picture, right? After this lawsuit was over, I just continued to do what I was doing, except focus it on the big picture. And you could see all these, um, these horrible crimes, uh, telephone harassment. <laughs> that was a that was a, a weird story, right? Um, jumping the turnstile, possession of a hyper, hypodermic needle, possession of drugs. Um, what else? Assault. Eh, I told you, man. Don't fuck with me, man. People, you know, you get pushed. You, you know, it's like the, the a lot of that um, a lot of that early day, right? Was uh, you know mob mob stuff. I, it was like, I, I don't think I read that part of it, but uh, I'll read it right now about growing up around the mob. You know, yeah, as a drug dealer in high school, if you stole drugs at my school and weren't from my neighborhood, you got beat up so you wouldn't do it again. Selling pot and steering traffic for dr harder drugs and stealing whatever wasn't nailed down was the nature of my teen years. Violence, crime, and the code of mafia silence were introduced to me very young. But at, at 19, I went off in a different direction. So that's, I mean, that's pretty much how I grew up. And I tried to, you know, and that's hence the, the criminal record. It's no excuse. I'm not, I don't make any excuses for it. But you could see, I think the last time, the last uh, drug thing was 1994. I was jumping a turnstile. You know, you're poor, you're starving on the street. You jump the turnstile, they catch you. And uh, I, I just end on the, the, uh, the legal part of it was um, here's a, a letter from, from one of the state senators that uh, concluded, although I didn't win the case because it was nearly impossible to beat authority, um, I did win, I did win the, the war against the, this ticket quota and vindicated myself in the court of public uh, opinion. So this uh, senator, uh, Senator Marty Golden, pretty much sums it up. The issues that Mr. Conti has raised concerning employment discrimination, retaliation against the whistleblower, and wrongful termination warrant a full consideration of his case. A one-sentence termination letter should not be sufficient, considering that it is likely that the appellant's disclosure of a, of a ticket quota system probably had an impact on the decision to terminate. It is my hope that you will act to reverse and lower, reverse the lower court's decision so that there can be a full consideration of Mr. Conti's case. Now, this was, um, uh, was the IG, uh, what was the guy's name? I forgot his name. Starts with an S. Uh, 
that was the uh, the AG at the time, and he got fired. Right? So but the Blasio too. Fuck you, <laughs> Mayor De Blasio. So so the point is, I've had this rich, you know, this rich history. This is who I am, you know, and here I am now, right? This this wonderful specimen of a human being before you. This is me at Barnes and Nobles doing a book tour. Right? Uh, you can't make this shit up, man. Pretending to be a cop as a young kid. Ah, a little baseball for you. Ah, skiing in Staten Island in Grandma's backyard. This is my first car. <laughs> it's 1969 Mustang. I ran the New York City Marathon. Three hours, 44 minutes, nine seconds. That was, uh, I guess, uh, 1982 or 1983, I forget. Uh, high school, high school picture. <laughs> ah, what a handsome devil, man, handsome devil. Look at, see, these guys don't think my hair is real. Huh? Uh, so, what, so what's that book about? The book's about some Buddhist shit, right? I've also been to Thailand. I was an uh, uh, ESL teacher in Thailand for a bunch of years studying some Buddhist stuff. I've, I'm the, uh, as the book says here, my uh, resume is, um, you know, the, the book, The Psychic Investor, took off. Um, I was a professional psychic in nightclubs after that, during that, actually. New York, I was, uh, I'm a native of New York, a TV mystic. Uh, my commentary, I was an avid examiner of Theravada Zen and Tibetan boot schools of Buddhism. I finished Shambhala and Vipassana meditation training. Uh, my, my commentary, that book was all over the place. I was on Channel 9, T CBS TV. I have some clips that I haven't pulled up yet. i got to find them. I think they're on VCR tape. Uh, the appearances on TV. Uh, Money in the Morning, New York Observer, Online Investor. WBIX uh, business, the National Choir, the Street.com, Money Magazine. So I was everywhere at once, right? So, so what is the point of this video? Why am I why am I talking about this? It's just you have to, as as this thing grows and as I become a I guess a public figure again, uh, I just want to put on the record who exactly I am. I've never hidden uh, any <laughs> any of this background. In fact, I. I was trying to tell people over and over about it, and nobody really cared until, um, you know, until I turned my focus to the big picture, which is which is what I try to do now. I try to, I try to stay in the truth. I try to use my, my extensive resume of experiences. There's other things too that I've done in this uh, life. A lot of, uh, you know, odd jobs and such. But uh, I find that you know I find this to be very. Um, I find myself able to deliver this message of, of news and um, from having, you know, absolutely nothing and then trading the stock market during those days of psychic investor and having a lot and losing that lot and, and, um, and such. And, you know, and being able to find a, a, a find peace through um, meditation and, and spiritual pursuits. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's working in the background all the time right now, you know, so uh, that's, that's who I am, and um, I never pretended to be anybody. If anybody can point to any, any um, situation where I've never been truthful in that, in that uh, background, in that uh, history, um, point it out to me. I'm listening. So my name is Marcus Conti, and this is, uh, this is who I am. This is my channel, and if you'd like to contribute to this, to this uh, work going forward, via PayPal, through Patreon. Also, if you'd like to not contribute and go away, you're, you're welcome to do that. There's no door, you know, hitting you in the ass. There's no, you know, there's, don't let the door hit you in the ass. And there's also no chain, ball and chain holding you here. If this is something, if, if my experiences in life and who it's, you know, who I am now is someone that, um, that you don't jive with, I, I, get, I get you. Goodbye, <laughs> you know. You don't have to stick around. You know, I, w I wish you well, and I wish you well in your, in your uh, exploration of, uh, of the truth and uh, your, you know, whatever you need on a daily basis to keep you going. I, I, I salute you. So, um, you know, it's an, it's an open discussion. I like to hear what people think about it. I mean, I, you know, put your comments down below, you know. And um, 
let's move this ball forward. You know, we're moving into an election year. I'm excited about it. My, you know, my work so far on this, um, in, in YouTube, uh, was, you know, the Caesar Sayak story, uh, the, the, the borderline shooting, right? Ab above and beyond the DSNY exposure, but, um, also this, you know, the, the LARP wars with, uh, with crazy characters that, you know, cut each other up and mainstream news, you know, so that's where I focus. I, I don't know, I don't know exactly what I am. Am I a journalist? Am I a, a uh, you know, am I a uh, YouTube personality? Am I a LARPer? Who knows? That's for you to decide. I don't get to decide. I don't get to decide my title. You decide. I am what I am. I'm someone who focuses on the truth and I, I lock in like a heat-seeking missile to what I think is true, and I try to, I try to expose the, the lies along the way. Or even at the end sometimes, it turns out that I was wrong. But it's the exploration of the story, you know, following the story that exposes the, the uh, nuisances uh, there. You know? So at any event, you know, live events, where, wherever it may go. So going forward, what excites me right now is the 2020 election. The the the, uh, the the arrowhead of our government is now is in the balance. Which way does this country go? Will we will we ever see a just you know economy in to you know diffuse income and wealth inequality in this country? Will we deflate the military industrial complex? Will we get health care for our people? Will we get college tuition at city and state universities free? Will we break up the banks? Will we, will we restore some sort of morality and some sort of sanity to this country, country? Or will we just keep going on the same trajectory and burn a hole in the ozone and, you know, extinct ourselves forever and ever? So that's my take on it. So Marcus Conte reporting on himself today, exposing the exact nature of his, of his wrongs and his rights. Become a, uh, also, uh, don't forget to subscribe. Marcus Conti reporting.